Today is August 2nd, 2021, and my guests are James Salzman, the Donald Bren Distinguished Professor of Environmental Law with joint appointments at the UCLA School of Law and the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and Michael Heller, who is Vice Dean and the Lawrence Wien Professor at Columbia Law School. Together, they have written MINE, that's with an exclamation point, MINE, How the Hidden Rules of Ownership Control Our Lives. Jim, Michael, welcome to EconTalk. Thank you. It's great to be here. So this is a book that covers a lot of EconTalk uh, favorite topics. Uh, property rights is at the heart of this book. But what is fun about the book is it is a exploration of the subtlety of property rights. And through, I think most human beings think about the historical nature of property rights. See, something's either mine or it's not. And it's that's like, you know, Mike, my house as long as I don't have a mortgage. But we tend to think of property rights as on or off, one zero. And what your book does beautifully is explore the rich nuance and subtlety of property rights currently and in history. And I want to start with a seemingly uh, peculiar example, which is early on in your book, which I loved, which is the airline seat. Michael, what is the story of the airline seat? Well, actually, it was the genesis of this book as well. Uh, we, uh, we were flying, and um, uh, this actually happened to Jim. Uh, the person in front leaned back. Jim was actually preparing a talk to give, um, uh, as he does a lot, and someone leaned uh, his, her seat uh, right back into Jim's lap. Uh, now, that raised the question, like, whose space is that, uh, the space behind the seat? Does it belong to uh, the person in front with the recline button, um, or does it be uh, uh, belong to the person in back, the person who's trying to get uh, some work done? And what we realized is that those conflicts come up Absolutely, all the time. Not just in airplane seats, but land and um, uh, you know radio spectrum, where where you have different people who are shouting "mine." So with the airplane seat, the person in front is saying it's mine because that space is attached to something mine, attached to the back of the seat. The button controls the recline. And what we realized is that what the person in front is doing is she's claiming mine to one of the oldest principles of ownership, which is attachment. And Jim, sitting there in back, is saying, no, it's mine because I had it first, first in time, and I possess it. I'm actually physically using the space. Possession is nine-tenths of the law. So we realize that that very tiny interaction, one that's familiar to all of us, having somebody lean into your lap, that tiny interaction involves three of what turn out to be just six simple stories that everyone uses to claim everything in the world. And that one is attachment, possession, and first. And of course, you might ask, so, so why are these fights breaking out? Because it turns out um, there are a lot of fights over who controls this, this wedge of space. And as Michael said, uh, the, the fight really is over ambiguity, right? You've got these competing stories. Who owns it? Now, there are a few really interesting things that come out of this. The first is, why are these fights breaking out now? Because they, they didn't used to break out. Right, and so there are at least three three things that are going on here. Um, first of all, we're using the space differently than we used to use it before. We used to have it for rubber chicken. Uh, now we use it as a workspace. We use it as our entertainment. Right, so the space on the tray actually is is valuable. Right, its value has gone up. Um, second thing is people are larger. Right, so the space is is compacted. The third uh, is induced scarcity. Right, so it turns out that the pitch, the distance between seats on an airline, that's the term for it, has shrunk. And everyone who flies knows that, right? On, on Frontier and Spirit, basically your knees are in your abdomen just when you sit down. But the pitch has gone from 32, 33 inches, <coughs> excuse me, to about 26, 27 inches uh, on, the, on the budget airlines today. Uh, and so why are they doing this? Every, every inch saved of pitch is the equivalent of an extra row for the airline. So it's real money. Uh, and so the airline is, is actually creating this problem by, you know, in, in any con talk, it's taking a valuable space uh, and, and it's basically uh, making it make it scarce, and more comp more competitive. So why the fights? The airline could say you have the right to recline. They could say you have to ask or, or you can't recline. They don't. And one of the things we point out in the book is this actually is a very clever ownership engineering strategy. We call it strategic or deliberate ambiguity. And it happens a lot. And the beauty for the airlines is the passengers get angry at each other instead of getting angry at the airline, who really is causing the problem here. And so the airline creates this uncomfortable situation. 
People try to work it out. They rely on customs, norms, good manners to do so. And it usually works, though not always. Um, or they simply say, forget it. I'm going to go to economy plus, or I'm going to go to, to business class. And obviously it's not just airline seats, right? Everyone knows the, um, the unspoken jostling uh, over the armrest, right? With, with elbows um, or, you know, overhead space. Yeah. I mean, these are examples. I have to say first off that as someone who towers over many of his fellow human beings at five foot six and a half, uh, the, the smaller pitch is one of the rare examples where I'm, you know, it's not so bad for me. Uh, there, it's not in my abdomen, you know, it's only in whatever, <laughs> but my pancreas. But um, it, it's a strange example and a fascinating one because, first of all, as you point out, it's a private space. This is not a government situation where I expect the government to come in and fix this, although it could. If there were enough violence involved, we could imagine a regulation that that just that decided these questions. But instead, what usually happens is there's a norm that develops. And through most of my lifetime, I think I'm older than both of you, uh, the most of my lifetime, the norm was you can recline your seat because there's a button there, whether because there's a button or not. And you point out the button seems to encourage the reclining. Uh, you can recline your seat. And by definition, and it is about a five-year-old, in my experience, I mean, seven-year-old phenomenon where people resent the reclining in a way they did. And it's for exactly the reason you said. The space has gotten smaller, and sometimes you can't even physically open your laptop all the way and, and do your work. So that phenomenon, which is relatively new is a common phenomenon, ha has made it more challenging. Often what happens in these situations is norms emerge anew. They change, and I think they have changed. I think – I don't recline my seat generally as I once did because I feel like, you know, it's it's considered gauche and it wasn't before. Uh, but I also I want to disagree with you a little bit and I'll let you react and then see if you agree or want to want to counter. Uh, I don't think it's so much in the airline's interest to have people fighting on their flights. You know, the ambiguity it has a certain advantage. It does allow them not to be the bad person who says you can't recline or you ha you may recline. Uh, both of those are unattractive, right? But it's also unattractive to get on a flight where you don't know what the rules are. So an airline that says our seats don't recline, but we give you more leg room to start with, or our seats don't recline, but we give you phenomenal non-rubber chicken for the tray when you're not uh, using your laptop. It, it would usually private entities have an incentive to avoid these ambiguities. So I'm, I, I don't think I think this they were caught by surprise to some extent, and um, we'll see if I think it'll change. Your thoughts, Jeff? Yeah. So, so, so a few points. So we do a lot of public speaking on this, and generally using Zoom, we have a poll feature, uh, and uh, we ask people: Should there be a right to recline or a right to defend your knees? And it's extraordinary because every time we do it, it's fifty-fifty. <laughs> at most, it's 60, 40, or 40, 60. It's incredible. And, and people, you know, look at each other with incredulity. How can you possibly disagree? Yeah. Uh, and so what's fascinating is that people hold these diametrically opposed views very strongly. They each yeah. are, are seizing their own, their own story. You're certainly right that, that there's a downside to the airlines. I guess where I would push back is at the upside, uh, which is selling, you know, having more seats to sell. Um, that seems to overwhelm it. And uh, they don't blame the airlines. Right. So, you know, people go in knowing, oh, what a hassle. Someone may, you know, lead into my seat. Maybe I should buy Economy Plus. Now, interestingly, FAA in 2018 deliberately chose not to get involved in this issue. They could have. Uh, mm -hmm. And if more fights break out, as you said, uh, they very well might. Michael, anything you want to add? So this has been um, uh, the norm evolution here is, in fact, happening. So Delta, for example, recently uh, cut the amount that the seats reclined from four inches down to two. I think in part in response to exactly the kinds of countervailing pressures that you're um, suggesting. Um, some airlines have started to do what's called preclining the seats, um, which is setting them at a certain fixed angle, which yeah. also resolves the issue. But it means the airlines lose the surplus from being able to sell that space twice on every seat and every flight. Um, the strategic ambiguity um, uh, value for the airlines, we think it's actually quite a substantial economic value for them, um, that most people feel like they're getting something extra. They know they're gonna be uncomfortable, but they're getting some little bit extra from either being able to recline or having that little space that's illusory space um, at the beginning. And as so long as the um, ire is directed at other passengers, so long as airlines can rely on these background norms of politeness and good manners, uh, that that lets them leverage uh, the ambiguity for 
uh, for their uh, benefit. And that seems to be what's driving the phenomena so far. Of course, the other thing, which it's a subtlety, but you, you didn't mention, and I don't think it's in the book either, is that a lot of times ambiguity is socially valuable. Uh, a short person sitting behind a tall person or a would-be recliner probably doesn't mind so much. I gave my, you know, the example of me. Yeah. It, it's a little like um, non-assigned seats at the movies. We, you know, we've increasingly moved to assigned seats in movies. You, and you mentioned that. One of the advantages of non-assigned seats, again, at five foot six and a half, I get behind a five eleven or six foot four person in my assigned seat. I'm kind of in trouble. And it would be easy to move over one or two in a situation where we can kind of work it out informally. Uh, and of course, as you point out, sometimes you could say to someone, can I recline my seat? I'll, I'll buy you a drink. There are other ways, Kosi, and we'll talk about Kosi, I suspect, later. Uh, to me, Ronald Kosi hangs over a good chunk of this book, and you, you mm -hmm. do discuss him. And I want to add, but in case we don't get to it, one of the rare cases where you understand actually what Ronald Kosi meant, which is usually not the case, which I, was, I just want to salute you. It's kind of a pet peeve of this program. We had Ronald Kosi as a guest. Uh, I think he was 102. Uh, and he he agreed with me that many people have misunderstood what he meant in that uh, article. Anyway, sorry, Michael, go ahead. So, yeah, so this is actually news you can use for your listeners, which is um, if you are being switched by someone in front, it turns out that if you um, there's an individual solution separate from a regulatory solution, the individual solution to being squished is not, it might surprise you, to offer 20 bucks to the person in front. They often will get offended. Yeah, sure. That does violate norms. And Other also, norms, it doesn't yeah. work to say, um, just please don't lean your seat back. They say, well, it's my right to, it's mine. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you, but what does turn out to work three quarters of the time is if you offer to buy a drink or a snack uh, for the person in front of you, they will take the drink or the snack. You've, established, you've sort of recognized their, their story about mine. You've mm -hmm. recognized attachment um, and you've honored it and you've sort of brought them into community with you. So that's actually quite a powerful way and a sort of cozy and bargain uh, to solve the people leaning into your lap solution, separate from any um, external regulatory solution. But there's a, there is a deeper point here, which actually goes to your sort of the threat, the thrust of your question so far, Russ, which is that property rights ownership is never static. People feel like it's a natural, a given, a timeless uh, answer. It's mine or it's not mine. Uh, what you characterize as the sort of on off switch view um, of property. And it's actually always, and in this case, much more uh, fluid and changing. And the it changes in, um, uh, specifically when you have more resource scarcity. So you mentioned COS. Another sort of thread, I'm sure, on your program is Harold Demsitz. Um, and yeah. sort of an, the sort of original, one of the original theories of the economics of property rights that they be, that they develop and emerge uh, in the face of uh, either increasing population um, or increasing scarcity or technological change. And the airline seat is basically a version of all of those bigger people yeah. and being squished together. So the same phenomena that you have for um, your genetic data, for your clickstream online, for um, electromagnetic uh, spectrum, for um, space for satellites, anytime you have more scarcity, you have more pressure on the existing stories of ownership. And they are just that, they're only stories in conflict with each other that at some given time might say attachment, the button controls, or it might say, no, my knees control. But that story changes um, as scarcity increases. And what we are seeing with airline seats is exactly that example of scarcity increasing. I'm glad you mentioned Harold Demsitz. Harold, uh, one of my favorite economists, it was a colleague of mine when I was at UCLA, and he doesn't get mentioned enough on this program. So I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought it up, but he wrote some really fascinating papers on the origins of property rights, or at least speculating about them. Uh, I'm curious in your poll of what people think is the, quote, who has the right, yeah. does, it differ, does it differ by age? Our have sense, you noticed? We've actually haven't controlled for age. I think actually even more salient is gender. Um, uh, so we think that there is um, some correlation between uh, women thinking they can recline and uh, men uh, being impatient with that. We are pretty confident that there is a correlation with height, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and but we're not sure about age. Uh, we can we can guess. I'm trying to think if we've had we've given this talk to older audiences, and I think mm -hmm. they tend to be a more pro recline. We might get up to as high as sixty forty on recline yeah, for an older audience. So. Yeah. What's so. interesting is we, we've never gotten more than sixty, and so there really is genuine disagreement, uh, no matter who the audience is. 
you know, it's one of these examples, though, I think, where if you're born with the norm, it's very different than if if it's evolved or changed during your lifetime, right? Uh, older people are shocked, I think, still when people answer their cell phone at the table or, or do things, cell phone etiquette. There's a lot of different cell phone etiquette questions. Um, but if you grew up with cell phones, I think you have a different etiquette than if it because for I think for older people, it's like it's like another phone. You would never get up in the middle of a dinner to go answer your phone. Well, you might. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, right. but those kinds mind, of you know, yeah. What, go ahead, Michael? I was going to say you don't mind if I text while we're talking. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, in fact, <laughs> listeners used to get angry at me. I used to take notes during episodes. I would, you know, type like a reference, say to Harold Emsons. I put, oh, I'll put a reference to Harold Emsons in the notes, and uh, p- the people thought that was rude because you could hear the clicking. I thought it was kind of flattering. I'm taking, you know, I'm, I'm noting something the guest said, but many, more than one person, not not a hundred, but more than one person said that's rude. I decided it's actually distracting to me in terms of my job as a host, so I, I've stopped doing that, and uh, I rely on other methods, including uh, some helpful people who work with me. But um, sorry, Michael, you were going to say These something. These norms are so subtle, like the yeah. norm, the etiquette norms of the cell phone yeah. use. Um, and, but people very quickly come to naturalize them, to feel like it must, it must be this way. It's always been this way. To do any, yeah. any other way is, is just rude. Um, and that same, those same feelings drive much of what we think about ownership. So one of the, actually the big challenges for us as law professors um, is that is basically tell, is teaching our students the extent to which law is overrated. Um, 99.99% of ownership debates happen are resolved outside of the law. Yeah. Um, and people and lawyers in particular, but lay people as well, often believe that law matters, that there's an answer. Yeah. And it's written down somewhere. And if we can just get the answer, we can do that. Um, and that isn't true. It isn't true for the airplane seats. It isn't true for most of the conflicts that you have uh, going, you know, when someone cuts in front of you in line, what's the answer? Um, well, there's there's a whole s- competing stories about mine um, that we can get into, uh, oh, well. but it is just that it is it, people are using one of those six very simple stories to basically get their way about some resource conflict, and then later you naturalize it as etiquette or norms or politeness or the way things are done around here. Yeah, I, I, I'm living in Jerusalem now. Moved here about six weeks ago, and we're trying to rent an apartment. And our real estate agent, which normally in America you would not necessarily use a real estate agent to rent an apartment, but here it's it's very common. And it's also common to have a lawyer to look at the contract, which is also very uncommon in America. Mm. And my real estate agent will say things – sometimes will say things like, oh, well, you don't have to worry about that because that's in the contract. And I'm thinking <laughs> – Mm, you don't want to use the whole idea of the contract of the, the, what you call the law is that you don't want to use it because it's very costly and you would much rather rely on norms that that you're familiar with but we're not familiar with the norms so we're kind of in a interesting interesting intercultural uh, cultural situation and yeah, moving to to a new country where the norms the norms are uh, very different yeah michael yeah so that's been one of our surprising findings in writing about mine is that many of the norms of ownership uh, turn out to have regional accents that you think it must be the case that it works yeah. everywhere in this way. Yeah. Um, and it's true like in Chicago that if you um, uh, dig out your parking space after a snowstorm and put a chair in the space, if somebody else parks in that parking space, their car is going to be defaced. And that's true in Boston. But where I am here in New York City, uh, that same act of possession, that same act of ownership, that same language that may seem universal or natural to someone from Chicago or Boston applies not at all. In New York City, after a snowstorm, um, you would lose both the parking space and the car if you've dug it out and left the space there. <laughs> so it is absolutely the case that no one's got ownership. Yeah. If you lose the chair yeah. um, or the um, car or the car, you know, New York is a, is a tr- tricky place. Um, but you but you would think that those norms are everywhere. But it right. turns out that the norms about renting spaces, buying spaces might be lawyered, might not be. The language of possession is one that happens almost completely outside of the law. And it's very subtle, but it's also very regional. The Boston part of the story is particularly interesting because the norms are shifting. So it used to be the case in South Boston. Um, that, uh, that basically a, a, a chair or a, a Fruit Loop box or an ironing board, any kind of object, saved the spot. And people actually knew whose spot, whose spot it was. The area's been gentrifying. 
And so there are these stories basically of folks moving in from New York and other places. Um, local businesses uh, are moving in also. Uh, and the parking spaces are, as with the airplane seat, uh, more valuable. Right? They're scarce. There are more people going in. And the people going in either do not know the norm or do not respect the norm. And so there has been a back and forth. So uh, as, as Michael said, uh, cars were getting keyed, a few windshields were, were broken. And so the mayor, Marty Walsh, now Secretary of Labor, said, OK, you get 24 hours. Right. You dig out the spike at 24 hours, but that's, you know, the, the police don't enforce it. Yeah. Um, and so and so basically it's it's a case of norms in transition. Right. So uh, Eleanor Ostrom, who I'm sure you talk about a lot yeah, in have. your program as well. This is classic Ostrom, uh, yeah. which is a, the closed community with reciprocity of sanction. That's all breaking apart in these areas that are gentrifying. Mm-hmm. I just want to mention uh Michael introduced the idea that, you know, we sometimes rely on the law without understanding or appreciating that it's ambiguous and sometimes uh, enforced more effectively. Some of the provisions of law are enforced more effectively by trust or other types of, of norms that emerge. I want to make a distinction that is that is we've talked about on the program sometimes, which is, which is between law and legislation. Uh, law meaning norms, expectations, legislation being codified. Um, and it's not quite your point, but I think it's an interesting way to to remember these these differences. I also want to invoke uh, the Chesterton fence, which is this idea that, you know, you see a fence there. It's like, well, this obviously doesn't have any purpose. Let's get rid of it. Let's tear it down. A lot of times the norms that that we use to resolve disputes that we might otherwise have are extremely important, solve lots of problems that wouldn't be solved by by either legislation or contractual agreement, so uh, I wanted to I wanted to just add that and um, and add that we could spend the whole time just on the chair, I think, or the seat, all just seat <laughs> examples. And finally, I, I do want to add. Uh, there's a wonderful essay on our site by Fred, McCh- the late Fred McChesney, on the the economics and uh, the norms around the Chicago and other cities uh, using a chair after you you shoveled out of space. We'll put a link up to that. Okay, yeah, someone really else want to comment? So McGill yeah. Chesney, um, Richard Epstein, there's been a, actually there's a, there's a surprisingly large economic literature, <laughs> the chair. Uh, Carol Rose, um, on parking chairs, p- possibly because Chicago, where the U of C is located, has a, has this very distinctive uh, parking chair culture, um, as does Boston, home of some other universities. Um, but it is such a good illustration of this point that you're making of, of the sort of um, uh, overemphasis on what you're calling legislation. Uh, what, you, uh, what lawyers would call the formal law, um, which is really a very tiny subset of um, how almost all ownership disputes are solved. That's really the, if there's one core to our book. It's really uh, making people aware that the language of ownership is very predictable. There are these very few simple stories. We've talked about attachment and possession and first so far. Give us there's the rest of them just to make sure we don't miss that. So these are the the narratives and and logic really of, of various regimes of property rights, right? Yeah, this so is what, really the yeah, this is really the contribution that we can make to your economics listeners who think of mine as often as an on-off switch. And what we do in the book is, is and each is each one each of the chapters takes one of these, is is lay down the sim- these six simple stories. So attachment is my home is my castle. Like what's attached to that deed of paper? How much resource control do you have when you say uh am I control the this, you know, these this uh, uh, two-dimensional plane. Uh, what else do I get? Attachment. Uh, first in time, first come, first serve. Um, you know, this is how kids decide who gets the swing on the playground. That's how yeah. geosynchronous um, satellites or uh, space is claimed in orbit. It's used all the time. Uh, who gets first? Firstborn son, historically, for inheritance. So first in time is the second one. Uh, possession. It's, and possession is nine-tenths of the law. It's mine because I'm holding on to it. Uh, that's the parking chair example, right? Possession is this very powerful language that we all speak, um, but we don't realize that we're speaking all day long, every day. So attachment, first and possession are three. Uh, labor is the fourth. It's mine uh, because I worked for it. You reap what you sow. Uh, this one is the basis for our intuitions about intellectual property, about patents, about copyrights, why we reward uh, those that that innovative effort in um, it's the emotional feeling behind it. It's mine because I worked for it. Uh, the fifth one is self-ownership. It's mine because it comes from my body. Um, uh, so your genetic data, why is that yours? Is it, the, is it belong to you or the gene company? And the sixth and final one is family. Uh, birth and death, marriage and divorce. Those are the moments when really a lot of 
wealth in our country moves around. So there's a notion that the meek shall inherit the earth. Uh, the reality under American law is that the meek actually get very little. So that's it. Um, attachment first in possession. That was the airline seat. Labor. Uh, um, Self-ownership and family. That's the only stories that people use. And it's, the, it's all the stories that people use to claim every resource in the world. And what you usually will have is someone, you know, you might be claiming attachment, the button controls the, uh, the resource, and I'm claiming first. Or I'm claiming my labor is what creates this genetic database. That's why I control the genetic information. And you say, no, 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 it's the, the, the data comes from me. It's my individuality. So that would be, you know, labor versus self-ownership. All ownership debates come down to a clash among those six stories. And it's, yeah. you know, if we get across to, to, to your listeners, this is, if, if, you, if you know the movie The Matrix, this is, this is a, a, a scene uh, where suddenly Neo sees the world as these streaming ones and zeros. These six stories allow you to do that. I promise you, if you look at the front page of your newspaper, you will find some kind of ownership conflict. And once you think about the six stories, you can dissect it and figure out what are the competing claims here. It really allows you to look at the world around you differently, much as the world looks different uh, when you start focusing on, on incentives. Uh, we think this is just as powerful a way. And, and the other point that I think is interesting is that as far as we can tell, this is it. You know, when we give these talks, people say, well, what about, you know, tribes in Papua New Guinea? Or what about, you know, what about Israelis? What about Canadians? What about so-and-so? And as far as we can tell, they're all relying on the same six stories, but they emphasize some of the stories differently than others. So in some communal, uh, some communal groups, family or group is much more important than, you know, labor, for example. Um, but as far as we can tell, those are the six stories. That's it. Well, I think it's important. I hate to be so bold as to add something, try to add something to your six stories, but I, and I'm not right. going to add a seventh. Don't worry. Okay. It's like, oh, <laughs> you guys missed it. We've got a second edition. Yeah, it'd be great, be great, actually. <laughs> but I think there's something else to add, which didn't strike me until we had our conversation, which, uh, so one, one value of the six is it's a, it's a taxonomy. It's a way to organize your thinking. It's a way to notice things you might not have noticed. But I think the other thing is, is a little more uh, hidden, which is that it, it comes back to what we started talking about, which is I think we have this sort of naive idea of it's mine. Uh, what do you mean? It's mine. And what, what the six stories point out in many of the examples, and we'll get to some of them, Maybe we might just stick with the seat, but what this what what the examples point out is that what makes life interesting and challenging is that many times the stories conflict. There's tension between these, and of course, the person who's got the financial or, or emotional stake in one of the stories thinks, well, "What do you mean? There's only one story. It's mine because I did. I reap what I sow. I worked." Or it's in my house. You how dare you tell me? Or it's it's on my phone. I bought that book on my Kindle, and therefore it's mine. But of course, Amazon, as you point out, they yeah, can take it away from you. Which is no, no, no. They can't. It's mine. Uh, and actually, they can. Although I'm going to say I, I like my Kindle. I enjoy. Um, yeah, the Kindle is a great example. So one of the challenges about thinking about ownership today, and this is one of the stories we, that's actually one of the threads of our conversation so far today, is that ownership stories change as um, you have more scarcity and competition. And another way that ownership stories change is as we move online. So you talked briefly about uh, movie theater seats, and we were seeing a shift there as, as our cell phone technology changes, it becomes cheaper to create uh, property rights in individual seats. So we're beginning to move to individual seat ownership, and this is my seat in the theater, rather than first come, first serve, a different method for assigning ownership or control over the seat for that particular movie. But that's also true as we move to a lot of our lives online. So we have this very physical notion of possession. Possession is nine tenths of the law. A notion that actually goes back uh, to the earliest legal systems four or 5,000 years ago um, that already had in it this notion of possession um, as giving rise to ownership. But when you move online, that's just not true anymore. And Amazon and Apple uh, and other big tech giants have figured that out. And what they realized is that you as a consumer uh, bring your physical notions of ownership to your online life. And it turns out that today about 85% of people believe, and this is a recent poll out of the University of Pennsylvania, 85% of people believe that owning, that downloading a book onto your Kindle is the same as buying a physical copy of the book. And it's not. Amazon and Apple can and have actually, have actually deleted uh, books and movies right off of people's devices. 
Uh, they can't come into your home and take the book away, but they can simply delete it uh, without compensation from your device. They've retained uh, that right in the agreement that you have with them when you've downloaded it. And what that means is that online, possession is much closer to one-tenth of the law, not nine-tenths. And that difference between what you feel like you own and what you actually own is very economically valuable for Amazon and Apple. Just like strategic yeah. ambiguity is profitable for the airlines, that ambiguity is profitable for Amazon and Apple. And what it means is they earn an extra premium on every download because you think that you own something different from what you actually own. What you actually own is different and less. That's, a, so that's Russ, one of the new stories ahead, of possession. So, so Russ, to give another example, think about your smartphone, right? What do you actually own in your smartphone? It turns out you own a plastic brick. Right, because what's valuable about your smartphone, the operating system, you don't own that. The data, you don't actually own the data. Your data, your data that runs through the um, the phone. What you are doing essentially is licensing access to a series of ones and zeros. It's a totally different way of thinking about property that you know. Excuse me, we're hardwired uh, to think about. Uh, it, it's a, it's a fundamental. It's a fundamental change as our lives and our assets go more and more online and become uh, digits, literally, just intangible digits. And of course, I can, in some sense, I can resell my phone somewhat akin to the way I can resell my car if I'm not leasing it. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there may be restrictions on what the phone can do after I resell it that I don't imagine, but I might be there. And I might be willing to pay a premium to avoid those restrictions. Of course, there are many, you know, examples like that in the in the digital world where, and in the real world, where your property rights expand or contract depending on which version, whether you get the deluxe or the the less the less fancy version, whether you paid a premium for it or not. Um, let's talk a little bit about foraging because I thought that was so interesting. Um, you, normally, you would think whatever's we're going back to the. I think Michael alluded to it. This two-dimensional plane of my property. So I own a house, say, I don't now, but I, if I owned a house, uh, normally I would say, well, whatever's in my backyard is mine and I can do with it whatever I want because it's my backyard. We've talked on the program before. You actually can't do whatever you want with your property. You can't build a, a little hut in the back and rent it out to people. There could be zoning restrictions and all kinds of things that your home is not your castle. It's it's somebody else's castle with you uh, or there's limitations on what you can do with it. And but but the foraging, which is a, a strange, a little bit old-fashioned English word for looking around for stuff you could eat, mostly, uh, that that used to be different than the way it is done now. So talk about that. Uh, whoever wants to go first, talk about how foraging, looking for wild mushrooms or uh, fruit or game has changed over time. Uh, and you might want to bring in the Wild West, which is an example economists love and barbed wire. So you can do that too. Go ahead. Well, so you, you go back to the earliest uh, days of the American settlement. Um, the sort of notion that we have now of the no trespassing version of America um, actually wasn't the law at all. It wasn't um, the way America was settled. Uh, back in the day, um, everybody had the right to roam over their neighbor's land. They could hunt. Uh, they could pick blueberries. They could uh, dig clams. Uh, they could basically um, provide sustenance for themselves using their neighbor's land. That was true in every original state. And it was true in all 50 states as the states entered the Union. Initially, uh, we had actually a right to um, a right to roam. Uh, now, there were exceptions to that. Um, an owner could uh, turn the uh, forager into a trespasser. You weren't trespassing. You weren't breaking the law when you came onto someone's land. Uh, you had the right to be there. Um, so the way that they would uh, change uh, the, the entitlement, basically say, I, the landowner, can keep you out. You can't forage on my land, as if they enclosed it, if they put a fence around it, if they posted it with signs that said no trespassing. Actually, the sign itself turned the forager into the trespasser. That's why there's very detailed rules about the size and distance apart those signs have to be, because the, the sign itself is what actually shifts the property right. And then third, if the land was uh, cultivated or urban. So you can't just forage in somebody's backyard in a city. That was true back in colonial days uh, and true today. But the history of ownership in America was uh, put a lot more premium on basically um, using the resources productively. So people who were laboring 
uh, won out over people who were claiming the attachment principle. It's mine because it's attached to my land. They lost the people who possessed and labored to uh, secure game, pro pro you know, probably because protein was scarce and the uh, people who are actually going out there and tracking down the deer, uh, they were the ones who basically made the laws and they were the ones who were rewarded. And that's changed. That changed in part uh, because of the invention of barbed wire in the 1860s. You know, the um, images that you have of, um, you know, those huge cattle drives going across the American West, that was true only for a very small number of years. Those cattle drives were mostly uh, uh, covering uh, a land that was owned by private homesteaders who had just recently um, kicked out the Native Americans. Uh, so the homesteaders didn't have any way to stop the cattle. So their attachment rights did not include the right to not have the cattle trample over their land. And barbed wire, when it was invented in the 1860s, uh, transformed <coughs> Uh, the American West. It made it possible for homesteaders to have a line that they could defend against uh, cattle. Cattle would get injured by uh, their by their brushes against barbed wire. And that, it was that moment that actually changed America, that made the attachment version, the no trespassing version, that now seems so natural about what it means to own land in America, uh, came into being really around the rise uh, substantially of barbed wire. And then state laws have now followed. Now in about half the states, uh, you actually don't have the right to forage um, over unposted, unenclosed land. So it's been a, sort of another story of the evolution of property rights there, mediated substantially by the invention of barbed wire. Jim? Yeah, so let me give you a modern example of the, the talk about the attachment principle. So the, the intuition of the attachment principle you know, goes way back. Roman law had this idea that you owned from heaven to hell, this sort of you know um, cylinder. That Three-dimensional. Three-dimensional, exactly. Thank you. That goes from your two-dimensional land. Uh, and it seems silly now, but uh, in the early 20th century, a number of lawsuits were brought against airlines uh, for trespass. They said, hey, you know, you're flying over, over, over my land. Uh, you have to pay me. Fortunately, the court said, no, no, no. Uh, air rights, you know, end at, at a certain point. Um, okay, you know, good. We, we have an airline industry. Uh, what about drones? Right, so pizza delivery services, uh, FedEx, DHL, um, they see a future where drones are delivering goods. Uh, and the question is when a drone flies over your backyard, not at 10,000 feet, but at 100 feet or 150 feet, is that the same thing as basically a delivery person clambering over your fence and, and running along uh, with, the, with the box and jumping over, jumping over the next fence? The government has said how high a set, how high a drone can fly. It's silent about how low a drone can fly. And there's a story in our book about a guy um, uh, who basically shoots a drone out of the sky over his backyard. Uh, and uh, he says, look, you're, you know, you're trespassing. Uh, and it, it actually goes to court. Uh, and, and he wins. He actually to raise some money. He sold his shirts. It said hashtag drone slayer. Uh, so he hit his own, his own merch. That went along with this. Um, but, you know, this is an issue where th there's real money uh, at stake here. Uh, and one of the interesting things that Michael was talking about is um, you can now lower transaction costs. And so rather than the on off switch, right, either you can go over people's property or you can't with a drone, one could imagine microtransactions where you say, sure, you can fly over my property, but you have to pay me a penny. Uh, every time, every time you go over, it with GPS that actually could be tracked uh, at, at low cost, and so that I, I suspect actually that that may be where we end up uh, once this all shakes out. And the other example is down to hell because the fracking revolution, <laughs> which took place in the United States, did not take place in many other countries because the government owns the space below the ground, whereas in America, for whatever reason, I think you talk about a little bit what is the history of it, but in America, I think in Every state, perhaps it's a national, it's a federal thing. Uh, you own the resources under your house. If you find gold or oil, gold, black gold, you're um, it's yours. And there's issues of of, prop, of common property, and because oil and water tend to pool and across people's uh, below the, not just below one's own house, but across multiple houses, which adds some complications we may get to. But uh, that that's a very very that seemingly like Oh, that's interesting. I guess you, you could have it that way. It turns out to have made an enormous difference in the world because otherwise I don't think we'd have had the, the fracking uh, explosion we had in the United States.
Yes, yeah, so it's, it's interesting. It, it's state law, not, not federal law, but basically, it, it, you know, it's a classic argument or for, pro- for private property is that if it's yours, you'll invest in it. You'll right? take care it's, of it, yeah. Exactly. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the implication of tragedy of the commons. Um, one of the really interesting things you get into, though, uh, with so-called fugitive resources, like water, like oil, is they move. Yeah. And so imagine that, that, that we're neighbors for us, you and I, uh, and you've got a well, uh, and I've got a well, and I bring in a big diesel pump because I want I want a lot more water to you know to grow marijuana, which you can now do in California. Um, and one day your well goes dry, <clears throat> and you your intuition is, hey, you took my water. And the law uh, it, it varies state to state, but in a number of states, basically it's it's too bad. Right. right. If the water moves, uh, leaves like a wild, a wild animal leaves, it's not yours anymore. Now you think about it. And of course, this creates a terrible incentive, which is you're going to say, OK, I got to get my pump and get my water out before, you know, before my neighbor does. And you get a tragedy of the commons dynamic. Now, there's always an issue of transactions costs and they're monitoring. Uh, in some of these cases, I assume there's not as much risk that you're going to pump all the water out because you're probably not running a farm off your water. You're just drinking and showering and doing the normal things. Whereas if it's oil, we better fix that because it's very valuable and it's worth monitoring how much comes from where. And uh, you talk in the book about unitization as a way to solve that problem. If you want to talk about that, Michael, or something else, go ahead. Well, just briefly. So one of the (coughs) areas that we're getting into and one of the sort of threads of our book is making people aware, um, not just that ownership is always a choice, it's mine. It's not just that it's mine or not mine. It's which story are we going to tell? But each of those stories are then implemented using some technology. So ownership really is the is the um, way that we socially engineer who gets what and why in our society. And that form of engineering isn't static. You know, barbed wire changed the American West. That was a kind of physical engineering. But it turns out we also have um, ownership engineering that we use all the time. So my parents, for example, when I was a kid, um, my brothers and I used to fight all the time about um, who would get the biggest slice of pie for dessert. And they wanted to use their ownership of the pie to eliminate that dispute. And they engineered it in a very smart way. They said, you as the oldest, Michael, uh, you cut, uh, but you choose last. And that form of ownership engineering solved uh, or optimized what they were trying to achieve with the pie, which is fewer disputes that they had to arbitrate. Yeah. And it's the same thing with oil and gas. So unitization is a way that you basically pool ownership of the surface landowners and have uh, just one, and you treat the surface landowners as if they were a single owner of the underlying pool. So instead of each surface landowner drilling their own well and destroying the pressure in the oil field, so nobody gets very much oil at all, what the unit manager does, the person who operates that entire area on behalf of the surface owners is they drill a single well and they optimize at the speed and location to get the most oil out. So that's a form of ownership engineering. And there are many of these. I assume they're only able to do that because technology allows them to know how far the pool extends. Is that correct? Uh, Effectively, although unitization started before they had really advanced geology. Um, And so it, it, it really was more sort of where do you find where you do you just find poke a hole pumps? and see what happens. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, where, 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 where are people putting, you know, the, the, these, you see these pictures of wildcatters, right? We're just there, 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 you know, well sites everywhere. They basically say enough, right? We're going to basically treat you all together. But, but two additional points to add on. Uh, you most certainly do see this problem with water in California uh, in sure. agricultural areas. Uh, um, for sure. And yeah, so yeah. that's, you know, that's a, the blue gold out there. The second thing, and this is an image I'd like to suggest to your, to your listeners, uh, to build on what Michael was saying is think of ownership as a remote control for social engineering. The, the owner of the resource basically shapes how you get things in order to really uh, shape our behavior. So just take a, a simple example um, is uh, the HOV lanes. I don't know if they have those in Israel or not, but stands for high occupancy vehicle. Originally, this basically <coughs> said, you know, for the fast lane, which had been first come, first serve, once you got in the fast lane, you were there, even if you were driving slowly and people are, you know, on their horns or you're driving quickly, that's your space. You're in there. That's not the case around many American cities now during rush hour. Uh, HOV, initially the remote control was government saying we control this lane and we want to reduce the number of cars. And so we're going to give an advantage to carpoolers, right? More people in a car, you get the fast lane. Uh, in, in some state, uh, some states, some cities, 
if you have a hybrid or an electric vehicle. We want to address air pollution. We're going to do it that way. And now what we're seeing in some cities uh, is they're saying, we'd like some money. And so, and so we're going to move to congestion pricing. Yeah. Uh, and so outside of Washington, D.C., at rush hour on certain stretches, you can get into town in the fast lane, but it costs you over $30. Uh, and so the, the, the key in all these places, and, and Michael's parents, you know, they had the remote control. You want the pie? Okay. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to basically use the remote control to, to program you to cut them equally. And so you'll stop bickering. Yeah, let's um, let's talk about cats in the condo, which I thought was uh, interesting. Um, and I, you know, there are a number of um, you'll remind me of what the technical term is in certain cities. If you live in a certain cities, there are certain restrictions on what you can do with your property. I remember famously, I've talked about it on the program before, Irvine, California. You can't leave your garage door open for more than a certain length of time because imposes costs on other people would be the argument. They want it to look a certain way. Uh, you have to cut your lawn. Uh, you're not free. It was another. This is like the anti-foraging. You want to let your <laughs> you want to let your lawn grow. Too bad. Well, you've got to forage it. Um, and those are public. And those are city ordinances. But the cats in the condo is private again. It's an interesting example of of changes in property rights voluntarily agreed on if you move into the area. Same with Irvine. And we rely on competition among municipalities to give people choices, but it's imperfect. So talk about the cats in the condo law case, because I, I thought that was that was quite interesting. This is a woman, um, uh, Natore Narstad. She moved into a big condo uh, complex in Southern California. Uh, and uh, she brought her three cats. Um, uh, actually, they're, let me think, remember their names, uh, Boo Boo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dockers and Tulip. Her three, they were noiseless indoor cats. Thanks for sharing um, that, Michael. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, Boo Boo was uh, spotted one afternoon by a neighbor uh, in, in the window of her living room who reported uh, the cat to the condo association, which then promptly fined her. This was a no-pet condominium association. Uh, she didn't pay the fine. The fine started accumulating. It soon added up to tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, she sued, and she said this, um, this private agreement um, uh, cuts too close uh, to the my home is my castle notion. So we have freedom of contract in this country, uh, but we also have sort of core notions of property. And what the question the case came down to in part was, to what extent can you contract around fundamental notions of what property are, what fundamental notions of what your home uh, can be? And she said, it cuts too close to my personal uh, sanctity uh, to be able to tell me that I can't have a cat living with me uh, in my home where the cat is a noiseless indoor cat um, and it uh, has no effect on uh, on my neighbors. The case was one of the most watched cases in American property law history. It may sound like a fairly dry question, but it was a crucial case for the survival of the condominium form of association in this country. Uh, uh, starting in nine, before 1960, basically nobody lived in condos. That, that legal form hadn't really been invented. Just like unitization solved the problem of overdrilling in oil fields, uh, the condominium uh, form of ownership technology is what made it possible for people to live together much more densely in cities and suburbs in America. So that form was imported and adapted uh, from Germany uh, and then brought into Puerto Rico and from there to New York City. And from there, it spread across the country. And we went from zero to about 70, now nearly 80 million Americans living in some form of condo association. And the question in those condo associations is, does every boo-boo, dockers, and tulip get a day in court uh, if, the, um, if, uh, if, if Natore doesn't like what the association is doing? Or does the association have the final say on these property ownership questions? So the case was fundamental. It was, you know, it was a case about boo-boo, but it mattered whether or not that Booba got her day in court to prove that she was a noiseless cat. And the California Supreme Court in that case said, no, uh, 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 Booba does not get her day in court. That once you've signed uh, the contract, uh, as crazy as a no cat policy may be, or you must close the garage door policy, or you must plant these flowers or paint it a certain color, or uh, there's uh, places where I say, if, you, if your dog's paws touch the lobby, of the of the uh, of the um, building, you get fined. Whatever it is, the association basically gets the final say, and that's pretty much become the way condominium law has evolved in this country. And that's what makes it possible is that condominium associations, by and large, don't need to defend against claims from individuals who live there. If they don't like that condominium association. The theory is 
they can move somewhere else. Because they, they agreed in writing when they first moved in. Now, here's the rub. Uh, and you said this earlier in your question, which is, uh, we assume they will have diversity of associations and people will find the one that suits them. Uh, we have several hundred thousand, about 250,000 condominium associations in this country, and they all use the same pattern uh, documents. So actually, although there's a huge number of these associations, and in some cities like Phoenix, it's virtually impossible to buy a home that isn't in one of these associations, there's actually extremely little variation. So if you have some idiosyncratic desire, like liking cats, uh, you may well not find the place to live in that community. So it does push us back to the question, what should be our fundamental values that go into what it means to own a home in this country? And maybe some of that can and should be protected from uh, the notion of freedom of contract. And indeed in California, the legislature there after this case uh, basically passed the Boo Boo Protection Act and said you can sign whatever condominium association you want, a document you want, but you can't exclude a cat or a dog. I'm tempted to quote the Mikado and say that invoking the names of the cats adds verisimilitude to an otherwise bald and unconvincing narrative. But I think it's accurate. I don't want to say that. Uh, but I think it raises a lot of interesting questions. I'm just going to – let me just say a few things about it, and then, Jim, you can, you can weigh in. The first is that there are a lot of things that are against the law and liter literally, meaning there's legislation about it, and – Many of us, when confronted with a lawbreaker, will just keep quiet. So if I saw boo-boo in the window, even though let's say I don't like cats, I happen to like – I'm okay with cats. Not so – I like cats more than dogs. So I'll just leave it at that. But if I saw a cat or a dog at the window of a house indoors, I would just say, you know, I know it's legal. It's against the covenant of the place, but I, I would just leave it alone. And I think as we – become more I worry that as we become more litigious, meaning prone to lawsuits and using legislation as and regulation as a way to to mold and shape behavior, I worry that we we become a little less tolerant of, of those kind of things. And and I understand if you're allergic to cats or you don't want you know certain you don't want children say in your condo association because you want quiet or whatever it would be. You know, I understand the the freedom of, of choice that's that's there. But the other thing I just want to add is that, of course, many times we don't allow any of that freedom of choice. We don't let people sell their kidneys in the United States. An example you talk about and we've talked about on the program before, uh, there are a lot of things where, again, it's my body, but we say, oh, but not there. And and we say it's your castle, but not for cats because you signed this piece of paper. And it's not – a lot of times those covenants are not actually enforced until somebody speaks up and then there's a conflict and the law, the legislation, the – the state intervenes. But I, I just think it's a fascinating example of, of that sort of interface between what's legislated or contractually agreed to, what is allowed to be contractually agreed to. A lot of things, like you talk about it in the book, indentured servitude, you're selling yourself into some form of, of slavery used to be a very common thing. Everybody thought it was normal and wonderful, actually, because capital markets didn't work so well. And it was a way to get access to, to resources for people who didn't have any capital. And all of a sudden, that's not – well, it's disgusting. We don't allow it at all. So, you're, you know, we let – in America, you're allowed to to do whatever you want uh, except. <laughs> so, anyway, go ahead, Jim. Sorry about that. Yeah, I mean, the, no, there's a lot in what you said. So let me just pick out two two particular things that we can move on. I mean, one of the things that economists basically use this incredibly antiseptic term, transaction costs, uh, which I think is, is – is, it's, it's a nice, you know, broad term, but it's unfortunate because – People are, it doesn't capture the emotion and the nuance uh, of uh, the fact that conflict is stressful. Uh, and, you know, there's a phrase you hear, don't, don't try to out-psycho a psycho, right? Once you start trying to enforce a rule uh, against someone who is who's not complying with it, it can escalate quickly. Uh, and wow. that's why we tend to, you know, part of it is we tend to work things out because you don't want to to escalate these things. And I think there's, uh, there's no question, I think, um, uh, in, in, in many parts of American life, we tend to be escalating a lot more. People call it polarization, partisanship. I, th I think it's a broader, yeah. it's a broader issue. Uh, and, and ownership is one way, is one way that um, that comes out. Um, the second thing is, you're absolutely right in that uh, you know what we assume uh, is uh, is inviolate, right? You can't sell parts of your body. Um, much of that is technology contingent. 
so you take surrogacy, surrogacy today, uh, the conception takes place uh, in a petri dish, right, in a test tube, and then the, the embryo is implanted. That's a different kind of situation than when the surrogate was quite literally the, the biological, the biological yeah. mother. Uh, and so, you know, the, the notion of how should you be able to own your body? You know, can you, can, should we allow women to be surrogates? The technology changes the contours of yeah. that. It's a great point. Great point. Uh, Michael Munger, 39 time, I think, guest on Econ Talk. Pro- I think I think he uses the phrase transaction costs in every all thirty nine of those. So, and he's a Doug North student. So we'll probably have a whole episode on on defending transactions costs as a con- as a sterile concept. But uh, I just wanted I just wanted to invoke him there. I think he'd appreciate it. Uh, we're we're almost out of time. Uh, many other interesting examples in the book, but I wanted to just talk about the Kosian one that you discuss. As again, many of them are Kosian, but the one that you explicitly discuss is a really interesting one, which is I think about it all the time because uh, recently, because I'm in Jerusalem, a lot of people like to be able to look at, out over the old city here in Jerusalem. And of course, what used to be a great view can be ruined by somebody building a taller building in front of you. Um, a lot of cities deal with this in more you know, obvious ways, dealing with sunlight, because uh, that's going to be an issue. But your example, which I, which I loved, is – it, for obvious reasons, because the emotional content of both both example both pieces of this, uh, redwood trees grew tall and blocked solar panels. So, uh, what happened in that case, and what does Ronald Coase have to do with it? Yeah, so this is this took place in the, in the wonderfully named town of Sunnyvale in oh. uh, in Northern <laughs> California, and yeah. it's basically this sort of e- ecological cul de sac. You've got two neighbors. Uh, one neighbor has solar panels, puts in solar panels. The other neighbor is growing redwoods. And as you described, the redwoods grow uh, and in time throw shade on the uh, on the solar panels. And so this being the wonderful country of America, they sue each other. Right. <laughs> uh, and um, it's it's basically uh, uh, it is conflicting claims of attachment. Uh, my home is my castle. If I want to grow trees on my property, it's my right. Um, the, the second attachment uh, argument is a bit is a bit subtler. It's saying I have a right to the sunlight. That is attached to my solar panels. If you block that, you've basically taken something that is mine that I have a right to. Yeah. Uh, and interestingly, uh, you know, we think of this as it has to be I win, you lose, or you win, I lose. State of California put their thumb on the scale of the solar panel owner <clears throat> and said to the redwood owners, "You have to top your trees." There's a wonderful quote. The redwood owners say, oh, we're, "We're the first people in the history of California." Uh, to you know, to basically uh, be criminals because we're growing redwood trees, yeah. and so that's the classic simplistic notion of ownership. Coes gives a very different and more nuanced way to look at it. So Coes would say, "Look, um, it's not just you know I win, you lose. What if you said, okay, solar panel owner, you win, but you have to reimburse the redwood owners for the loss of of, of lopping off the tops of their trees." Suddenly, the, the solar panel owner thinks, well, how much uh, you know, is this shade really costing me? Maybe I can more cheaply just move where the panels are. Or equally, if the redwood owner wins, um, then they have to re- reimburse the solar panel owner for the loss of electricity. Uh, and it creates much more room for creative solutions that wouldn't be there if it's I win, you lose. But as Coase pointed out, and this is the part I liked about your book especially, is that some people misunderstand Coase as saying, well – Whichever is the best thing for producing maximum value, they'll agree on. They'll come to an agreement. But as you point out earlier, uh, sometimes you, you have a psycho, and transaction costs become immense. And Coase recognized that he's not an idiot. He's a very <laughs> thoughtful and smart man, and he made the point that when transaction costs are high, which they could be either because there's a lot of people who are growing the redwoods or who are blocking your solar panels, which is unlikely, but it could be, and in many other situations, it is. If the transactions costs are high, you don't, you can't rely on gains from trade effectively or arbitrage to to solve this problem, and that produce the highest value. So you you will assign property rights then to the person who can you either use the resource with the highest value or can avoid the harm with the smallest cost. And I think the deeper insight, which you know Don Boudreau and I have talked about recently in, in an episode, is that it's the idea that that harm is reciprocal. It's easy to think, oh, it's the fault of the tree grower because the trees block the, the, the shade, block the solar panels. 
but it's also the fact that the solar panel person wants to get the sun and the other person wants it. There's no there's no moral issue here. I think a lot of people caricature Coase in, inappropriately by invoking moral examples where I think they're wrong. Meaning Coase, you don't apply Coase. They're right. You don't apply Coase. They're wrong in saying therefore Coase is horrible. It, it, he's again, he's not an idiot. He understood that there were there were, I assume he understood the morality often was 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 different. Or you could add that to the scale if you wanted to in terms of cost or value. But so many times, you know, people who say, well, you shouldn't the example we use in the book, you shouldn't allow people to have the right to pollute and then to be able to trade those rights. Well, you might want that if that means less pollution or a pollution at a much lower cost of, of, of restraining it. And, and to cast that as a moral question of harm or oppressor and oppressed rather than just here's two people arguing over what's mine, it, it, it's much better to remember that and you'll get better public policy. Michael. So um, Jim and I auditioned stories for this book. Every, this book is all stories. When, when we first conceived of the book seven years ago, we first started working together on this, uh, what we, the sort of framing in our mind, the tagline for the book was, we are going to write Freakonomics for ownership. So a Freakonomics that is explained really complicated economic principles about incentives, microeconomics, using cool stories about sumo wrestlers and drug dealers. And that's, that's our book as well. And what we're trying to show is that exactly you know, the, the story about um, the solar panels and the redwoods, what we're trying to show there is that not many resource conflicts, um, you can sort of understand them more clearly by taking away the notion of fault. And yeah. that really was very much Kosa's point. You can understand the conflict as just uh, sort of uh, the only reason that the uh, solar panels are a problem is because of the redwood trees and vice versa. Um, and you understand them as reciprocal harms. And that was really the, one of the first insights that he had was taking what was sort of seemed like insolvable, unsolvable conflicts and making them more um, sort of legible as about reciprocity. And then once you have that reciprocity, the next step are the, are the points that you were making about and Jim was making about sort of how do you solve the conflict? So that's where the notion of transaction costs is so valuable, is studying, uh, is understanding that we don't live in a perfect world uh, where people would just work it out uh, because there wouldn't be spite, there wouldn't be transaction costs, they would have perfect information. So what he, I think what Coase was so powerful in contributing was looking at the structure of why the bar pointing economists, but also lawyers, to asking, why is it that these bargains are failing? Like, what is it about the structure of a bilateral, just two neighbors? Uh, what is it about that that sometimes leads to failure? And then if that's the case, are there ways to reduce the cost of them bargaining with each other? Or do you, or is, is that less costly than some regulatory solution like the California Solar Shade Act? And there's going to be costs and benefits um, for private transactions and costs and benefits for regulation. What Coase so helpfully pointed us to is looking at the underlying ownership of underlying structure of ownership and having us realize that those stories are just in conflict and can be um, told, right? So each of, so each of the, the Redwood owner and the solar owner, they were just telling stories about the attachment principle. And both of those are plausible stories. And we have to decide between them based on the tools that we have that Coase very much taught us about learning about the structure of bargaining that arises in different circumstances, like when it's just two neighbors and where you might have spite and what you do in that context. I think it, it's, it's got a much broader application. And I think, Jim, you're maybe alluding to this earlier. So often in these cases of conflicting property rights, there's a moral outrage component. So, you know, it's not just, you know, I'd like to recline my seat and I'd like to be able to open my laptop. It's you have no right to do that because I can only see my story. I can only see one of the six, and I can't even imagine that you've got one also. <clears throat> and once I invoke the moral high ground, of course, I think I deserve to have my story be triumphant. And it, this is a much bigger problem than property rights. What Coase, it's, of course, part of our problems with natural with national conversation in, 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 in much of the world today. And and I think what, what Coase teaches, which I think is disturbing. I'm a big fan of morality, by the way, as a, as a decision maker. But what Coach, Coach, Coach reminds us is that a lot of times morality is not what's at play here. It feels like morality, but it's actually just that your narrative conflicts with this other person's narrative. And their narrative is actually 
in many situations, the right narrative, just as yours is. But in this case, they conflict. And you're going to have to either work it out or privately, or you're going to have to find you know, a legislative or regulatory solution to, to avoid if it's a case of high transaction costs, and you can't work it out effectively. But I just think that that insight that Again, I think a lot of people criticize Coach like, oh, he didn't understand morale. I think they actually understood something deeper, potentially. I don't know how much he understood it, but it helped me understand it, which is that 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 moral outrage, that indignation that your story is just wrong. It's actually just a different story. And it also applies to things way beyond property rights. Well, I mean, everyone is a hero in their own narrative. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. And the way that works out for our world is, is you know, is um, – well, we are very much trying to get across with the solar panel story, with the airplane seat story, with the parking chair story, with ones with we have dozens of these stories in the book that are like these counterintuitive, surprising stories. Is that I think for many of your listeners, uh, they have intuitions based in morality, based in their value judgments about what the answer must be, and that that's great. And what we want them to see is that ownership is always a choice; that it's not fixed, it's not natural. It's not a given that they're when they're when someone's pushing back against their story, there's real value to saying, what is the other story that's being told? Who gets to be the decision maker? What language of ownership counts for resolving this conflict? Do we resolve it informally as neighbors? Do I offer them to, you know, to buy them a drink so they don't lean back? Like, what are the different tools that I can use to resolve ownership stories? Because they aren't a given. The law isn't the answer by and large. These are choices and their choice is ultimately based on our deepest values and morality. So if that's like one message that we can get across, which is to empower your listeners to have to be less afraid of ownership. And people often think of ownership as being something dry, as being something written down somewhere. That's certainly when we when our when our law students come into our law school classes, they think learning about ownership is like going to be like studying the phone book. They think they're going to basically learn hundreds of really boring rules until they want to kill themselves. And that's just not what ownership is about at all. Um, it's very much the image people have of, of ownership. It's just this dry, dusty set of laws. But that is so far from the reality of, can I lean my seat back? Can I fly my drone over your backyard? You know, Can I get my genetic data back if I swab my cheek and find out my ancestors? All of these debates are debates that are up for grabs. They are choices that we're making. I mean, they're choices that we're making among a very small number of sort of tractable stories, stories that kids learn on the playground. Like my son and daughter were fighting in the sandbox when they were like, this is their, when they were much younger. And one of them was saying, they were both saying it's mine. They were holding onto a shovel. It's mine, it's mine. And it turned out one of them was, my daughter was saying it's mine because I had it first. And my son was saying it's mine because I'm holding on to it. They were both absolutely sure that the shovel was theirs. And they turned out that even as little kids, they were already using two of those stories. And those stories are always up for grabs, always up for grabs. So to speak, as it were, and I, I just would mention uh, the Tom, tract in the Talmud, Baba Metzia, which is about similar issues of, of holding and grabbing and first and, and disputed ownership, which is a very old, as you say, goes back thousands of years. Jim, anything to, to close this out? You want to add? No, I think Michael put it well. I mean, the fact is ownership is fundamentally a question of who gets what and why. Uh, and that's always going to be up for grabs. It always has been. It always will be. My guests today have been James Salzman and Michael Heller. Gentlemen, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. The book is called Mine. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.